Um, good morning. Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is David Denning. I'm a, a clinician interested in aspergillosis, and today I'm going to speak to you about itraconazole. Um, this is a drug that was originally licensed in 1991 and so has been around for a long time, and there's a lot known about it. I'm going to try and summarize that fairly briefly for you. So we're going to look at the structure of itraconazole. Um, we're going to look at how it works as a drug, which is similar to all the other azoles. Um, and we're going to be aware of the spectrum of activity of itraconazole as well. And so if you look at the, um, the structure of itraconazole, it's a synthetic triazole. The ketoconazole and myconazole were precursors, and itraconazole is a long, long structure, as you can see here. It's a long structure similar to ketoconazole, protoconazole, but different in, uh, in various side chains. It's about 705 uh, in terms of molecular weight. That means it's a fairly large drug by comparison with many others, and it's called a second-generation triazole. So what it does, like all the other azoles, is it inhibits the uh, production of agosterol inside the fungal cell. So human cells don't have agosterol. We produce cholesterol, so therefore it's selective for fungal cells. And it's through this enzyme called 14-alpha-demethylase. And... Um, there's a, quite a long pathway, and uh, it starts with an osterol, ends up in a gosterol, and there's various different uh, intermediate uh, molecules produced, and some of those are toxic to the cell if they accumulate. And so one of the reasons that nitrocolazole is effective is because you get accumulation of the intermediates which kill the fungal cell. And because we don't produce agosterol, this drug has got limited toxicity for human cells. It does have toxicity, as I'll show you, but it's limited. So this is a diagram of that uh, uh, pathway, starting with acetyl-CoA, which is part of the Krebs cycle, through squalene, squalene 2,3-oxide, to lanosterol. And uh, you end up with all of the azoles operating at this step um, just after lanosterol. And agosterol finally ends up surrounding the fungal cell in its membrane. Different from the cell wall, it's a cell membrane around the fungal cell. Now, itraconazole works against quite a lot of different uh, organisms. It's active against most candida species, um, including candida cruzii, although, which fluconazole uh, is completely inactive against. It also works against cryptococcus, although it's usually not cidal against cryptococcus, uh, and it's not usually cidal against the candida species either. It's got very good activity against uh, many of the dimorphic pathogens, including blastomyces, um, coccidioides, and histoplasma. It's very active against dermatophytes, which cause skin, hair, and nail infections, including microsporin, which tibinophene's a bit inactive against uh, epidermophyton and the trichophyton species. And it's pretty active against aspergillus, and it was the first oral drug produced for aspergillosis, uh, and that is it, it sort of claim to fame, if you like, um, because that was really of, of great value to, to the world when it first came out. It's also very active against sporotrichosis or sporothrix, and has a little activity against fusarium, but it doesn't work against cetosporium species. So um, it's a, a little bit like fluconazole in terms of its spectrum, but it's got much better act aspergillus activity and much better uh, activity against the endemic fungi, such as blastomyces and histoplasma. So this is a chart showing that, and uh, you can see that there's not much to choose between the different azoles against candida albicans. Um, none of them are terribly active against candida gabbrata, and candida cruzii uh, is really not uh, inhibited at all by fluconazole, a little by itraconazole, but it's not very active, and boriconazole and posiconazole are better. Cryptococcus, they, these drugs are similar. Um, itraconazole doesn't get into the spinal fluid as well, which is why fluconazole is preferred for cryptococcal disease. It's active, and uh, as is voriconazole, posiconazole against aspergillus, and fumigatus and terrius and the other species as well, very active against blastomyces. Uh, pretty good against coxy, um, good for sp histo and sporotrichosis, um, and really not much activity against fusarium, cellosporium, and the mucorales at all. So uh, what we want to do now is to just look at the kinetics of itraconazole. How does this drug get into the body, and how is it 
dealt with by the body. And there are different formulations of the drug, so that has implications for uh, how you actually use the drug in clinical practice. So in, um, the, if you take the capsules, and most people take capsules, that's the typical formulation, the bioavailability is at just over 50%, 55%. It's much better bioavailability with a solution. So in certain groups of patients, that is important, and AIDS patients is one of those groups. Cystic fibrosis is another important group, and uh, patients on H2 blockers and neutropenic patients with mucositis is another group where this difference is really quite important. Um, there's a big food effect with itraconazole capsules, which improve bioavailability. So we always advise patients to take itraconazole with food or with Coca-Cola, because acidic drinks are also valuable, or orange juice or some other uh, fruity drink. And, and therefore, this ga and the gastric acid is important. But that it doesn't pertain to the solution, which is absorbed whether you have on uh, taking any food or not. It doesn't get into the uh, see a spinal fluid, but it does get into brain tissue, particularly if there's um, uh, infection in the brain. Uh, it's highly protein bound. Um, it's uh, got, um, it's metabolized by the liver, um, and it has a metabolite, hydroxyitraconazole, which itself is and has antifungal activity. So you get the activity of itraconazole and you get the activity of the hydroxyitraconazole. And that's got a slightly shorter half life than itraconazole itself. The half-life at low dose is 21 hours. It goes up to 35 hours with, uh, as you have a higher dose and then patients on steady state drug. And it comes out in the urine as metabolites and feces uh, also, also as metabolites. So if you look at the profiles compared with the other azoles, um, its solubility is low compared with uh, a fluconazole. Um, its absorption is erratic in the capsule formulation, so you get variable levels, but not with the solution. So you get good absorption with the solution. Um, there is this a food effect, which I've mentioned, um, and you've got this half-life, which is, varies by dose, but starts at about 24 hours and goes up to about 42 hours. Um, the range, we, we, we often want to measure and check that the patient's got enough itraconazole in the blood. And um, there are different ways of doing that range. You can do it with a bioassay, which gives you higher levels because of the hydroxy metabolite, uh, or you can do HPLC levels. And so on this slide is shown the HPLC levels, um, which suggests that you should have a level more than 0.5. Um, and uh, if it's a lot more than one, then that's good. Uh, uh, but if it's very high, then you might have some additional toxicity attached to it. And, um, and this is a way of monitoring and making sure the patient's getting a, the right dose. And sometimes we're able to reduce the dose in patients on long-term therapy. So here are some illustrations of the, uh, of the actual capsules. There are many, many generic formulations of itraconazole. And uh, there are also many, uh, about two or three different formulations of itraconazole solution as well available. The drug is also available as an IV. It's not used very much um, in many centers, but it, it was originally used for an alternative IV therapy compared with amphotericin uh, for aspergillosis, although that's not very common, as I say. So why would you want to use itraconazole? I've sort of given you a clue about that with the different fungi to which it's, act which it, which it's active, and then what are the dosing for those different indications, and what about the side effects of itraconazole? So the drug is used for oral and esophageal candidiasis, particularly oral candidiasis, and it's useful when there's fluconazole-resistant disease as well. Uh, it's used for vulvovaginal candidiasis, usually is at two doses. Um, there's a skin disease, pityriasis versicolor, which it's very active for, and usually a seven-day course. Many skin infections are dealt with by itraconazole very successfully, including um, Nayan infections, onychomycosis, and it, it's certainly used for aspergillosis, particularly the more chronic and allergic forms of aspergillosis. It's the drug of choice for histoplasmosis. It's an alternative for coccidioidomycosis. It's not used very much for systemic candidiasis, although it's approved for that. Um, and it's also used as second-line or third-line therapy for cryptococcal disease, particularly in primary prophylaxis uh, in areas where there's a high risk of other fungal infections. The dose for 
uh, oral, pharyngeal and esophageal candidiasis includes 20 mils per day and that's usually as solution because it's better as you swill it round in your mouth and it works better than just taking a capsule. And typically patients are treated for seven days. And uh, if they've got fluconazole resistance or they've failed fluconazole, then actually a longer course is usually given. For vulvogynic candidiasis, it's two doses over uh, one day. Um, for pityriasis versicolor, it's only 200 milligrams a day for seven days, so it's quite a short course for that treatment. And for tinea infections, we typically treat for uh, two weeks at a lower dose for two weeks, at a higher dose for one week. And the, this drug concentrates in the skin in the epidermal layers, so you get a, um, a concentration that lasts beyond the time of therapy. Um, if you've got uh, tinea pedis caused by trichophoton rubrum with cracking of the soles of the feet, then a longer course of therapy is usually required, uh, 30 days, although you can sometimes get away with 400 milligrams a, a day for, for, for a week because of the concentration in the skin uh, layers. The, the, for onychomycosis, you can either treat continuously at three for three months at 200 milligrams a day, or you can take seven-day pulse therapy where you take it at 200 milligrams twice a day for seven days, um, or, um, and you do that for two courses for fingernails or three for toenails, although many uh, doctors actually use a longer course for toenails. And in patients who've got non-trichophyton uh, or non-dermatophyte toenail infections, itraconazole is valuable because it works for some other of pathogens causing toenail disease, a particular aspergillus and alternaria as alternative uh, pathogens in that context. Um, and there's, between these pulse therapies, you can uh, use a 21-day interval, which is the typical way of doing that. And the idea of that was to minimize toxicity. For aspergillosis, particularly for chronic and allergic forms of disease, we use <clears throat> 200 milligrams twice a day. Um, that's the standard dose. Some patients need a bit more and some a bit less, which is why we monitor some of these patients' levels. And um, we usually use long-term. The typical course for allergic disease is four months trial. And then if they do very well, then we carry on. If they don't do so well, we stop. And for chronic disease, we often have to treat for six months or a year um, to really get a good response uh, in the patient. For histoplasmosis, we Particularly if it's acute, we tend to load the patients. So because it's got a long half-life, this drug, you can actually use a loading dose to boost the levels early. And for a serious infection such as histoplasmosis, this is valuable. And so uh, three days of a loading dose of 200 milligrams three times a day is useful. And then patients go on once a day, 200 milligrams once a day uh, if they don't have AIDS. And if they do have AIDS, we tend to use double the dose because of the absorption issues and to be absolutely sure they're getting enough drug. And um, in, in, we prefer the solution in AIDS because of, of the absorption issues, because some of these late stage patients don't absorb very well, they're not eating very well as well. Uh, for cryptococcal meningitis, if fluconazole is contraindicated, which is actually pretty unusual, or you're trying to treat another infection alongside, then the typical dose is 200 milligrams twice a day. And as I say, we really don't use it for candidemia very much at all these days. Now, sometimes um, in leukemia therapy, it's a good idea in patients who are high risk to give them prophylaxis to prevent them getting fungal infections. And so particularly AML patients and other high risk patients. Um, and so in this context, itraconazole has been extensively used with many, many trials. And it's clear that the capsules of itraconazole are not effective, but the solution is partially effective in reducing episodes of invasive aspergillosis. So the typical dose is five milligrams per kilogram uh, it, twice a day, and uh, it's given uh, just after the chemotherapy is finished, before neutropenia uh, settles, and then it continues until neutropenia uh, is resolved. Now, itraconazole does have side effects. It's um, like all drugs, it's a, got slightly more side effects than fluconazole, and nausea and uh, vomiting or sense of vomiting is quite common. Some patients have taste disturbances. Abdominal pain and diarrhea also occurs in some patients. 
It can upset the liver with a rate about the same as fluconazole, around 3%. Um, and this usually occurs in the first three months of therapy. Some patients uh, get peripheral neuropathy, particularly um, after three months of therapy or longer, but there are a small number of patients who get almost immediate peripheral neuropathy and, uh, or like a mononeuritis, and they need their treatment stopped, but that's quite rare. But the longer-term therapy does give some sense of numbness and toes or sometimes motor changes uh, in, in around 10 or 15% of patients, so it's a relatively common problem. Um, some patients get headacheness and dizziness. Um, some patients feel breathless with this drug, and that's because it can cause congestive cardiac failure in older people uh, in probably 1 in 200 or 1 in 300 uh, frequency. Um, and you can also get ankle swelling, which is separate from congestive cardiac failure. So some patients get breathless, and the drug needs to stop. Others just get ankle swelling, and then it depends on the severity of the ankle swelling as to whether therapy should be stopped or not. Um, a low potassium does occur in some patients, and so that's worth checking, particularly if they're on diuretics. Uh, occasional patients get a rash, and occasional patients get a, a, a visual disturbance. There's a whole load of rarer side effects, and I'm not going to go into all of these. This is no different from all of the other drugs that we give patients, or most of the other drugs we give patients. Um, but just to be aware that, that the patients may complain of other side effects, and if they do, then it could be due to itraconazole. And we do sometimes have to stop a patient's therapy uh, as a result of this. Um, so on a balance of argument, this is a drug which is pretty uh, safe. It's pretty effective, particularly for the endemic mycoses and aspergillosis and skin infections. It's got very good tissue penetration, although not the CSF. Um, it does cause liver dysfunction. We do recommend monitoring patients who've got, who are on itraconazole. Um, for most pathogens, it's fungistatic, not sidal, although that's not true for histo um, and some strains of aspergillus and dermatophytes. There is cross-resistance, so if a drug is resistant, uh, if a fungus is resistant to one of the other azoles, you may get cross-resistance, but it's not uniform. Um, the commonest reason for stopping therapy is feeling a bit nauseated, um, and in the older people, fluid retention is also common. There are a lot of drug interactions, which is a topic, a separate topic, which we'll address for all of the azoles together. Um, so it's really important to check patients the other drugs the patients are on before you give itraconazole to make some adjustments if necessary. And then these rare side effects of um, left ventricular dysfunction or congestive cardiac failure. And if you're giving the drug for a long period of time, then if, if you have therapeutic monitoring available, we think that's a good idea to check that the patient's got enough drug uh, and also for those who uh, have quite high levels to reduce the dose so that you can save money and reduce toxicity attached to that. With that, I'll stop and thank you very much indeed for your attention.